So I went and I took my money out of the ATM and I heard the door open behind me, you know, so I turned around, you know, I thought somebody was coming in behind me and there was a man who put a gun to my face and he must have really, 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 really needed this money because he didn't ask me anything, he didn't say a single word, I just remember looking at the gun in my face and him pulling the trigger and it was a revolver um, and to this day I'll never forget that image in my head of seeing that little little spindle turn and hearing that very distinct click uh, uh, of a revolver and it was it, it probably could have been like a 32 snub nose gun like this but when it was in my face it looked like one of those like cannons that you see on the movies <laughs> and I remember when when he pulled the trigger uh, I didn't think anything you don't think anything it, it just blank you just go into this like shock of blankness uh, and then a couple of seconds later, thankfully I had been doing martial arts uh, and that might have helped me overcome the fight or flight syndrome because all I could think was, go! You know, like, like myself kicking myself, like, what are you doing? Go! So I, I bum rushed him, we went flying, he went flying, money went flying, gun went flying and I took off and went to the hotel and didn't say anything to anybody. We went back to South Carolina the next day um, and I didn't say anything because we weren't supposed to be in New York. My grandfather would have killed me. If that guy didn't kill me, my grandfather would have took care of it. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't say anything until about a month or two later, you know, I kept having nightmares about this same incident. I kept having night terrors uh, from, from this incident. And so I told my grandmother about it. And she told me the same thing that the, uh, that the officer had told me. She said, you know, uh, you have to realize that God has a purpose for your life. You're here for a, a reason. There's no, people don't go through the things that you've been through and still walking on this earth without a reason. And you're pushing the limit. This is what she told me. You're pushing the limit, really. Um, God has something for you, and, and He wants you to get it, but you're pushing it. And she didn't tell me to go back to Christianity and study my Bible. The only thing she told me was that God has not went, ha hasn't gone anywhere. You just have not looked in the right place yet. Um, and so I decided to put myself back together. You know, the, the car wreck... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the gun thing, the getting arrested for fighting, like all of that like really made me stop really quick and think you know that I need to get my, my, my stuff together. So I became somewhat, uh, I became an agnostic, uh, someone who believes, I believed in God with no form of religion. Um, I prayed to God on the floor on my hands and knees because this is how all the books of God, this is how the, 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 the Bible, uh, the Torah, the, the New Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, the, all of these scriptures that I ever read, they said that this is how the men of God prayed. And uh, it was during this time that I did read one book about Islam in the public library because I had never heard of Islam um, uh, uh, ever. Um, but I remember I was looking in the religious section in, in the library at, at at school and there was a book about Islam and uh, I was in the library, the public library and I remember it was some title like why I'm not a Muslim or or some you know one of these titles that, that was uh, propagandistic against Islam but I, I, I had no idea so I just took the book and I read it and I remember it said that Muslims uh, M-O-S-L-E-M-S -E and any of you knowing Arabic knows that's a very derogatory word a Muslim is someone who oppresses someone else that's a very quick sleight of the pen that was used in the past for a very real purpose um, it said that Muslims were people who uh, worshipped a moon god named, named Allah uh, who lived in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia and uh, they were oppressive to women I remember there was a whole chapter about how they could have four wives and as many as they want actually because they could marry two, divorce one, get three more, you know, this whole, you know, um, and, it, and it, it said that, you know, uh, uh, I remember the, the, the one thing that really caught my attention was the whole uh, chapter on jihad where it said that Muslims were allowed to kill non-Muslims at any time, at any place, without discretion and it was an honorable act and not only would they go to heaven before it but they would get 70 virgins on the way. You know, so I closed the book on Islam, put it back on the shelf, and marked off Islam off my little list of religions, and said, thanks, but no thanks, and if I ever see a Muslim, I am out. Um, and I said, I'm pretty safe in Greenville, South Carolina, I had never seen a Muslim ever. So I said, you know, I don't have to worry about running into no Muslims, thank God. So, you know, I, 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 I started, you know, just worshipping, you know, I tried to just be a good person, you know, pray to God, ask Him for guidance try to be a genuinely good person um, and I remember the, the, what changed is when I met a Muslim 
I met a Muslim who I had met a couple of times at school. We had went to school together and I knew him, but I never knew that he was Muslim. And, and there's a couple of reasons why I never known he was Muslim. Uh, because he was African American, number one, and the book said that Muslims were Arabs. And number two, I didn't know, you know, I thought Muslims ran around, you know, marrying as many women as they want and killing non-Muslims. I didn't know that they could also be part-time drug dealers. So I didn't know, I never knew that this guy was Muslim. I didn't put two and two together. So we were at his house one day. And me and my, my, my other friend, the one that you know, I got into a lot of trouble with, I'm trying to keep him out of trouble now. Um, we were at his house and we were debating something about religion. I, for, I forget what even the topic was, but you know, you have two teenagers thinking they know everything. Um, and I was trying to explain something to him about the Bible. Uh, and that guy came in and, and was listening. He said, have you ever heard of Islam? I said, yes, I've heard all about Islam. <laughs> he was like, Okay, so what do you think of it? I said, what do you mean what I think of it? That's probably the worst religion I've ever seen on the face of the planet. He's like, why? And he's like, I'm a Muslim. I was like, man, stop playing. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're, you're an African American. You know, he's like, so? I'm like, the book said you guys were Arab. They, all the, the Muslims were Arabs. He, and, and he was like, what else did you read in the book? And I told him, he was like, man, what in the, you know, what have you been reading? <laughs> He's like, you need to, 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 to go uh, to the mosque for Juma. He's like, I, he, he told me, he said, I'm not a good Muslim. This is what he said to me. He said, I'm not a good Muslim. I, I'm not even going to uh, try to front and say I'm a good Muslim. He said, but I can guide you to some people that can tell you the real truth about Islam. Uh, because he knew about my story about wanting to find religion. And he said, you need to go to the mosque for Juma. And I said, what's, what's Juma? He said, it's just like church with no chairs. <laughs> and I said... I can do church with no chairs because in church the chairs were the worst part anyway. <laughs> because they had these hard benches that you sit on that are like this and are so hard. I said, that's good. You sit on carpet? Wow, man, they should, every church should be like that. And uh, I said, where's the mosque? He said, it's on Wade Hampton Boulevard. I said, we're on Wade Hampton Boulevard. I, I lived on Wade Hampton Boulevard. I lived right off of Wade Hampton Boulevard. He said, you know where Lee Road intersects with Ray Hampton? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I live on the other side of that intersection. He said, it's right there. I said, no, it's not. There's nothing. There's a gas station or a church. He said, yeah, you know that church, the evangelical missionary training facility? I said, yeah, I used to take missionary classes there. He said, you know that building in, in the parking lot with the gold thing on top? I said, the, yeah, the gym? He was like, no, that's the mosque. Because I had always thought it was the gym because it was in the same parking lot and it was just rectangular with two glass doors in the front. And you could literally walk in between the church and, and, and the masjid and touch them like this. Anyone doesn't believe me, go to Greenville, South Carolina, look at the masjid. You can almost touch the both of them just like this. <clears throat> he said, yeah, it's right there. I said, I've never, you know, at first I was shocked. Like, I've been living across the street from all these crazy Muslims all my life. <laughs> you know, I said, I never knew. You know, and he told me to go to Juma, and I asked him what time. He, he said he would meet me there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. So I said, okay, I went on Friday. And I'm waiting outside for him. You know, I'm, I'm not going inside. That's not happening. Um, you know, and I'm seeing all these people going in. And at this time, it was a predominantly indo paki Arab uh, masjid. Anyone who went in even was, was not American, period. And I did not see even one uh, African American going there. And, and I did see one. And then when he went in, I heard him talking in a dialect that I realized was, he was probably from Africa. So I said, he's not American. Um, so I'm not going, I'm waiting and I'm standing outside sitting on the church steps and the Imam pulls up and parks right in front of me who I had no idea he was the Imam but he got out and he asked me, you know, am I, am I waiting for someone, this, that and the other and I explained to him, he said, oh yeah, we know this brother uh, you don't see him that, that, that much but we, we know who he is and, you know, he said, I'm glad you came, you know, he was a very, very nice, gentle young man um, and he invited me into the mosque and I kind of wanted to wait on my friend you know, but I didn't want, you know, at the same time, I didn't want to tell this man, I don't want to go in. So I went in, and they put me in the back and gave me a chair anyway. And I said, I came to sit on the floor. And they gave me a chair anyway, you know, and all of these people are piled up in front of me. And there's no Americans here. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, uh, if this is a setup. Because it's starting to smell like a setup to me. Because in my mind, I'm like, you've been set up before, and this, this seems kind of like this. So, and I'm starting to think in my head, you know, scenarios, you know, a young mind at play. 
You know, I said, this, this, this other guy, my friend, he probably was in the same situation like me, and he probably made a deal with them to get out as long as he brought other Americans and tricked them into coming to the mosque so they could do their jihad after Juma and get their 70 virgins. So I'm sitting here, and there's all these people in front of me, and then there's a curtain with all these people behind me making noise, and I have no idea who's back here. So I'm stuck in the middle of this. I hear that it's some women, uh, but I don't, you know, I, there's a curtain. I have no idea. So I'm like, there's something very odd about what's going on right here. I'm like, just let me make it. I'm starting to look for the exit. I'm like, you know, calculating how many people are between me and the exit. You know, I, I know some martial arts, so I said I might hit a couple of them and I'm out. And then the imam came, and I, I, I just now realized that he was the imam because he got up on the minbar, you know, and they, and they started to call the adhan. And, you know, I said, okay, that man seemed nice. He seemed genuinely nice. So I, I felt a little more comfort. And then he got up uh, uh, after the, the adhan and he started his khutbah. In alhamdulillah nahmaruhu wa I said, oh my God. I said, I bet you he's talking about me. You know, and he's being forceful. You know, he was getting loud and banging on the member and he's pointing in my direction. You know, I'm like, oh man, I got to get out of here really quick, you know. I said, well, I'm going to take my chance with the women behind me. I'm going through the curtain. <laughs> and then he started to, when he got done with his Arabic tirade, um, he started to explain it. You know, uh, that verily all praise belongs to, to, to uh, Allah alone, or God alone, and, and Him do we worship, and Him do we seek help and assistance. We seek refuge with Him from the evil that lies. You know, he explained what he said in Arabic, and it sounded to me so beautiful. It was very, very beautifully prose what he said, and I wanted to know where he got that, you know, I said, where did he get that? You know, because it was only about God, and, and, and about the nature of ourselves, all of us should, should know the, 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 that, that beginning of the khutbah, and he quoted the, the three verses from the Quran, all you who believe, fear God as he should be feared, and do not die, and instead of some, a state of submission to Islam, he was a very um, uh, wise man, because he translated everything, it was almost as if he knew I was there, and translated everything for me, you know, and, and he... I remember to this day what the khutbah was about and I don't know if he did it because I was there or if that was his already planned khutbah but it's almost as if it was meant for me.